the final item of business is members' business debate on motion 9970 in the name of Ross Greer on bus services. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Ross Greer to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, after this afternoon, I'm glad to provide members with an opportunity to vent frustrations about something other than our colleagues and other parties. Um, and I'm grateful to colleagues uh, from Labour and from the SNP for supporting this motion and allowing it to reach the Chamber. Bus services may not quite be the high political theatrics of the, this afternoon's budget debate, but they are one of the biggest issues for hundreds of thousands of people in every last corner of this country. And they're exactly the kind of issue that our constituents expect us to get to grips with. Just yesterday, a UK-wide YouGov poll on what policies people considered the most progressive found that reducing bus fares was seen as the policy that would most help those on lower incomes rather than the wealthiest. And it's not hard to see why. Over half of low-income households do not have access to a car, while many of those who do still rely on public transport in some way. People with mobility issues through either an impairment or age rely on buses to go about their daily lives. As do children and young people traveling to school or college, university or work. And for those looking for work, a reliable and affordable bus route to their local job centre, far, far less local after the last round of closures, is often the only thing between them and benefit sanctions which force them into crisis. Over 400 million local bus journeys take place every year. That's over three quarters of all public transport journeys. It's people going to work, to school, college, university, visiting friends and family, going to the shops, going to the pub, and just living their lives. Transport is central to all of our lives. It is a vital public service. Bus services, however, despite being the overwhelming majority of public transport journeys, are treated as anything but a public service across most of Scotland. They are instead run in the interests of private companies and their profit margins. As a result, we have seen bus services run for profit over people. So when times get tough, routes get cut, fares rise, and delays to pollution-reducing initiatives come. Now, I acknowledge, of course, that congestion is the single biggest issue uh, for public transport, for bus services in Scotland. The Confederation of Public Transport, whose chair is here today, have made that point very clearly. But, of course, fare increases will not make that situation better. They will, in fact, make it worse. It doesn't have to be that way, though. Lothian Bus here in Edinburgh is a first-class example of a publicly-run bus service run very much in the public interest. They are here as a minority, though. In Glasgow in the west of Scotland, McGill's buses have height fares for students by 50% this month by cutting their student day ticket. For a young person in Renfrew, a town without any rail links, for example, that's about £20 more every month just to get to college or university for a couple of days each week. And it's not the first time in recent years students have seen their fares go up with McGill's. One young woman hit by these changes got in touch with me. Living in a small town just outside of Glasgow, she has no other public transportation options than McGill's. She's seen the price of student day tickets increase substantially in the few years since she started studying, and she's struggling to stay on her course with the constant financial pressures. Over 5,000 people have signed a petition calling on McGill's to reinstate the student ticket. This petition was launched by local MSYP Josh Kennedy, who's done a fantastic job in raising the profile of this issue and winning much support across all political parties. Josh and I will be meeting with McGill's next week to discuss the impact this hike is having on local students, and I hope they'll begin to engage constructively with us towards an agreed solution. But it's not just McGill's, of course. Indeed, this motion was lodged before their most recent fare hikes have become an issue. We raised this issue as a result of the damaging changes announced by First Bus some weeks ago in and around Glasgow in the west of Scotland. Those changes include a 15% increase for adults and a 40% increase for under 16s. They come at a time where many people have not seen a proper pay rise for a decade and many benefits have been frozen. Now, thankfully, the decision to increase fares for unemployed people has been reversed for now due to public outcry and the cross-party work of Glasgow's elected representatives. It's hard to state what a disaster this could have been in combination with recent job centre closures and the nightmare of a welfare system built around draconian sanctions. The companies say that many of these fare rises are justified by restructuring to favour smartphone-based ticketing. But what impact will that have on those who can't afford a smartphone? As mentioned, low-income households are far more likely to rely on their local bus service. Where is the justice in having someone pay more for essential public transport because they cannot afford a smartphone? And there's a generational justice issue here as well. Less than half of those aged between 55 and 64 own a smartphone. And it's not just fare rises. Many routes have also been cut. The motion highlights the 4A route, which ran from Eaglesham in West of Scotland to Knightswood in Glasgow. That was changed by First Bus in 2016, leaving entire communities without services that were vital to many. 
a bus service ran truly in the public interest would not leave communities stranded in pursuit of maximising profits. Over the last decade, one fifth of all bus routes in Scotland have been cut, with Glasgow in the West hit particularly hard. Route cuts have hit residents in areas including Auchinairn, Dundalker, Bishop Briggs, Linwood and Paisley. Time and again, communities outside of central Glasgow and other cities are left cut off, or they face increased journey times as buses become more infrequent and more expensive. And passengers aren't the only one who lose out when profit is the overriding motivation. In Aberdeen, first bus drivers have had to resort to industrial action over an assault on their paying conditions. They've described these changes as Victorian, changes that would see them on the road for up to 10 hours a day and no longer paid for their breaks. They certainly have the green solidarity. In East Lothian, First Bus decided to cut all of their routes. Luckily, however, the public sector stepped in and took over. East Coast Buses, a subsidiary of publicly owned Lothian Bus, now run those routes. That's another example of the public sector picking up the pieces where the private sector has failed. MSPs will have received a briefing from McGill's, which does read more like a stream of consciousness than a policy paper, but it accuses us here of demonizing profits. And for once, I do not totally disagree with McGill's. Private profit should have no place in an essential service like public transport. The only priorities should be providing an affordable, accessible and environmentally sustainable service for our communities. Right now, we have a patchwork of private and public bus provision across Scotland, along with plenty of public subsidies for private firms. This has created a lottery for communities, with some cities benefiting far more from flat fares, for example, for all journeys, and some rural areas being better connected than others who are left nearly entirely isolated. We need to ensure that public options are available across Scotland so that everyone can enjoy high quality services. The private sector free-for-all experiment with public transport has failed. It has failed for decades. It is time for re-regulation and it is time for a public transport system that is run truly and entirely in the public good. We move to the open debate and I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Jamie Green. Speeches of four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to begin by congratulating Ross Greer in securing this debate. It, I know we put a lot of effort into and thank him for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. He uh, stated that um, perhaps buses aren't the, we don't typify high political uh, theatrics, I think was the term Mr Greer used. Well, I think if he's, you know, been door knocking an election campaign in rural areas like Howard and Loch Winnock and up the moor, he'll find it's a very pressing issue. Um, and I know my own constituents have um, lost bus routes over the last um, 10 to 15 years in places like Howard, Loch Winnock and up the moor. And I have, I have met with bus companies and what I've been struck by in this particular debate is, that, is this tension between private interest and public responsibility. Um, it actually makes me think to some degree, I think it's analogous to the uh, debate over bank branch closures there, private enterprises, but they have a public good. And how do we get that balance correct? What is the correct approach? And I think the proposals that are likely to be outlined in the transport bill, including giving more um, flexibility and options to local authorities is absolutely the correct way to go. I think what is important though, when considering this is actually looking at the, the broader context in which um, these decisions taken by First Bus and others have um, been, actually been taken in. We do know that there is worsening congestion, that car ownership um, is, has risen substantially in recent years. There is increasing cost. Bus operators um, are stating that costs are up 15% up in the last five years. And in, in, in important as well, bus journeys down by almost 15 million in the past four years. And the reasons behind that are obviously complicated. And as the bus operators themselves state that 75% of the factors behind this drop in patronage regard is being out with their control. So there's a duty there to go and sort of, you know, maximise the appeal of public transport in all its particular forms. But I think, and, and I think Roscoe was very, uh, very effective in the way in which he highlighted um, the context in which the fares, um, fare rises that have been proposed have actually been enacted and the particular groups in society which are most likely to be affected. He spoke of a, a generational inequality and I think that's absolutely um, um, a really key, key point. Um, I, I think it was allegedly Margaret Thatcher who said, it might have been someone else who said that anyone riding on a bus over the age of 30 has failed in life. Well, I can say I'm over 30 and I proudly still use the bus. Um, and I say it's, but it is particularly generational young people and particularly um, people um, who are um, elderly and retired. And I've certainly, it's a very difficult situation to square. I've found in, 
engaging with bus companies locally. There's, there's demand, but it's limited demand within village communities. And the bus companies simply say that we cannot justify this in terms of, um, in terms of our commercial interest in running this. And I think clearly the point that Ross Greer makes is that it's important companies like bus companies along with banks do have a public duty, they do have a corporate responsibility, but they also have a commercial responsibility to their, um, to their employees. And I say that as someone who in the Rainfisher South constituency has McGill's depots in both Barhead and in Johnston. So for me, my kind of view on this, I think a balance has to be struck. There has to be equity and fairness in fares. It takes cognizance of the ability to pay of the key groups who use bus services. But equally, there has to be um, regard given to the sustainability of bus companies. And I look forward to the introduction of the transport bill and its means of ensuring and giving that flexibility to local governments, um, local authorities, so that we can create a bus service that's truly sustainable and benefits all of our constituents. Thank you. Jamie Green, followed by Johan Lamont. <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Ross Gear for bringing this important debate to the Chamber this evening and for allowing me to participate and share my own views. Um, I think the motion raises a very important issue around the rising of fares, especially those which affect those under the age of 16 who are uh, perhaps less able to uh, absorb those rises. I think the example given both in the motion and in uh, Ross Gear's speech around a 40, 50 percent fair rise, I think in anyone's eye seems excessive uh, and unacceptable. And I appreciate the first bus is a private company, uh, but the private sector does have responsibility to ensure that consumers are given a fair deal. Uh, affordable local bus services are essential not just to uh, allowing uh, non-drivers to get around uh, in the way that Ross Greer mentioned, but also to help us meet our important uh, CO2 reduction emission targets in Scotland and to create a better environment in general. But to encourage people out of cars, they need viable alternatives. Uh, and that means affordable, reliable services which go from where you are to uh, where you want to be. Now, I'm in no way here to justify decisions made by private operators. Indeed, I've written many letters to services in North Ayrshire and share the frustration of constituents when services are reduced or even taken out of service altogether. But it is important that we look at the environmental context the companies are operating in to see what we can do to address some of the problems in the sector. Uh, KPMG found that 75% of factors uh, in operating a bus service were outside of the bus operator's control, and they include changing in shopping habits, growing car ownership, and traffic congestion. Now, on, over the last decade, congestion has caused the journey time to increase by 10%, uh, and uh, car ownership has shifted people from buses, uh, buses into cars. Um, we have a fundamental problem with bus patronage uh, in Scotland. It has reduced by 16% in the last decade. And it's no great surprise uh, that if a bus route is cut in your area, you simply move to the car. There's no other choice. And in my view, it's an unfortunate, quite vicious cycle. The routes are cut because of falling passenger numbers, but passenger numbers are also reducing because of routes being cut. So the question is, how do we break that cycle? Now, I know that bus uh, company uh, operating costs have risen by around 15% in the last five years, uh, but that cannot and should not necessarily translate into fare increases. So the, po the question I pose the industry is what are they doing to mitigate, mitigate such rises? A shift to more environmentally friendly and cheaper to run vehicles is one way forward. I know that Lothian Buses is an example of uh, investing in a greener fleet and that work is to be commended, but even they have satisfaction levels which have reduced to an all-time, uh, well, to a four-year low. So progress has been made in vehicle types, uh, but it is often the rural and small town services which are continuing to run older uh, rolling stock. Uh, I would like to mention the point of low emission zones uh, in this context, and I, I would like to raise concerns that if the zones uh, create uh, an environment where cities have restrictions around certain types of vehicles, it's really important that bus services do not compound the, uh, the problem uh, outside of cities by moving stock into the surrounding areas outside the limits of those zones. Uh, uh, so that's something else that we should um, uh, consider. Uh, I think there is a fundamental and perhaps an ideological debate over whether bus services should be uh, nationalised or further regulated or subsidised or indeed publicly funded. And I think that's probably a debate we don't have time for in the short space uh, today. Uh, but it is a debate that, uh, that should be had. I, I do welcome proposals, uh, or what I think will be proposals in the Transport Bill, that may look at 
uh, issues around giving lo local authorities more freedom uh, to operate models uh, which work best for their communities. And that's certainly a proposal that we'll look very carefully at. Uh, and sympathetically at as well. Uh, and also we have been calling for a long time to improve community bus services. So I will work with members from across the chamber on any sensible proposals that seek to improve bus services and I look forward to being part of the ongoing debate on this very issue. Thank you. Joanne Lamont followed by John Finney. Thank you very much Deputy Presiding Officer and can I add my congratulations to Ross Greer um, both on his motion and on his speech about Again, something I think I recognise across the chamber is a very important issue. I was very struck when First Bus Glasgow announced its um, price increases for its fares at the seasonal beginning of the new year at the reaction of people um, across the communities that I represent. The 10% um, uh, discount, for, or rise rather, for people who were unemployed, the 40% increase for young people at school, a number of other changes, and those in themselves caused a great fuss, but behind that began to emerge um, a picture that we know, and it's about how much buses matter to people. Um, it was flagged up to me as a consequence of raising this question of bus fares, not just people's anger about those fare changes, but the fact that very many people who are unemployed were not even aware about the discount for job seekers, that because of the way in which, and the, the minister can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the way in which the concession travel scheme operates, there is a perverse incentive for bus operators to keep the single bus fare high, and I think that is something that would be worth looking at. The EIS uh, contacted me because they're having a campaign around child poverty to highlight their concerns of what they call text poverty. That is the inability to benefit from a reduction in fares if you use your phone by the very people who would benefit most from that reduction, which is utterly um, ironic and unacceptable. And while I can understand why bus operators might want to move to these systems which are seen as um, more efficient, they cannot use the, the price structure of fares in a way, in a way that disadvantages the, um, the poorest most. That must surely be unacceptable. Um, and I would ask the Minister in his summing up to confirm what meetings he has had with First Bus Glasgow to raise these concerns about what I think a lot of people thought were very simply unacceptable decisions. And of course, on the point that was made by the last speaker about whether public money should be used in terms <coughs> of bus service, of course, the public money is already there. But the problem is there's very little or no accountability for that money. And I think it's entirely reasonable that that question is pursued. As has already been said, buses matter. The vast majority of uh, tr public transport journeys are by bus. And this sector is dominated by four large companies with simple consequences. We've seen a massive reduction in the number of journeys, the number of routes, and a rise in fares. And when we say people don't use the buses, it is a question of chicken and egg, and we do want stability. And I'd also highlight one other question, particularly in relation to young people. Young people predominantly now are flexible workers, and too often the public transport system operates on the basis of people working between nine and five. And in many of our communities, people are utterly disadvantaged because they can't access the transport they need to get to their work. Now, it's not just a question of highlighting concerns, but recognising there are solutions. This is a debate that's been in the public domain for a long time. I would congratulate, congratulate Unite for their Hod the Bus campaign and in declaring an, uh, an interest as a member of the Cooperative Party, particularly highlight the work of the Cooperative, the People's Bus Campaign, because we don't provide just an analysis of the problem, but offer solutions. The Co-op in particular wants to talk about community transport, how we can support not-for-profit uh, providers and recognise that the, the, the business currently is stacked against those kinds of organisations. And um, the, the, certainly the Co-op have a very particular view on how that can be taken forward. And I would ask uh, the Minister if he's willing to meet with me and my fellow cooperative party members um, and our group within the Scottish Parliament to discuss further with him how these can offer real solutions to the very real problems that have been experienced by far too many people across our communities. Buses matter. They matter a great deal. It's not just about fears, but it's also about sustaining communities and allowing people to get to work get to study and enjoy their leisure time. I call John Finney to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. I, I join with colleagues in congratulating Ross on bringing this motion. 
And uh, I think there's been some very interesting discussions so far as regards who uses buses. And uh, many people who use buses, of course, have no alternative. That is the mode of transport they're, they're required to take. And, uh, also, that we consider who uses cars. Now, clearly, if you have a car, you have the alternative of using a, a bus, um, and it's often seen as uh, inconvenient. So I, I go along with what uh, Tom Arthur said there, that we do need to maximise the appeal of, of using buses. And lest that's seen as criticism of car ownership, I, I would draw a very clear distinction with rural communities where a car is a necessity often, uh, in the absence of that, uh, the availability of transport. Community transport plays an important uh, role in some places, but at the moment is actually facing legislative challenges regarding uh, introduction. I know the Minister's aware of this, indeed I, I, I have written him and, and colleagues at, uh, his colleagues at Westminster are dealing uh, with this on the Transport Committee. But it's very clear that the car lobby has always been responded to more positively than the transport lobby and we heard um, from Ross Greer the negative impact on families, young people and low earners and the implications of reduced bus fares, the positive implications that could have. And it is the case that the public transport is delivered by the private sector and uh, that's an inevitable conflict there with uh, profit. Um, again, others have alluded to the loss of services in East Lothian. I know that there are similar issues in Mid Lothian at the moment. Um, um, and uh, it's right to say that, of course, it was a publicly uh, owned um, uh, response that addressed that void. Because services are operated purely on a commercial basis. Indeed, local authorities can offer subsidy for operation of, quote, socially necessary service, which cannot be provided in a, a, a commercial basis, only having established that it can't be provided. Now, there's a lot of stats being quoted and some more current than the ones I was going to say, but I, th I think it's important sometimes to illustrate um, some of the information. And this is from a SPICE briefing. 2014-15, 414 million local bus journeys. That was down 46 million in the, in the decade. And during that period, bus fares increased 13.5% above inflation, and as we've heard, often against a reduced number of routes. And the figure of £57 million local authority subsidy on the socially necessary bus service and £189 million Scottish government subsidy we have on um, concessionary fares. Now, much has been said of first bus, and it's not in my area, but I'm aware of the, the, the problems that have been caused there. And that's notwithstanding the significant public monies that go in. Um, I think issues about congestion have been alluded to, bus gates, um, people uh, in my own area, Inverness, frustrated about the efficiency of the service, but they all want to go and drive their motor vehicles into the town centre and be positively encouraged to do so uh, uh, by um, Highland Council. So I think we have to uh, make sure that it's practical to, to, to have buses run. Uh, reference has been made to the situation in Aberdeen, and I too would lend my support to the, the, the workers involved there with First Bus. There's been little, no consultation with local residents. I know that party colleagues um, have been liaising with Unite about that. And of course, what we, we have to deal with is a situation where there's cherry picking of routes that are profitable. So looking ahead to the, the transport bill, I want to see that as an opportunity to pr pr promote, for instance, the, the Lothian bus model there and making better use of the services. I, mean, uh, I think fairly recently I talked about the time when prescriptions used to come to people in the rural communities on the bus. The backs, <laughs> I'm showing my age. Um, but what we have to do is maximise. If our vehicle's going somewhere, it should be carrying parcels, there should be bike trailers and the like. Um, so, um, Socially necessary services must be delivered by, uh, in, in the public service. And there's a quote that some of you will be familiar with, and it, it is that true equality won't be reached when every citizen has a motor car. It will be reached when every millionaire uses public transport. We're way short of that, but here's hoping. Thank you. <coughs> Bob Doris, followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I start off as others have done by congratulating Ross Greer for securing this debate here th this evening? Um, when I saw Rossi's motion come through, I was preparing to lodge a, a motion of a similar nature, but I'd just like to make the point that this is something that you don't compete with motions on. You sign up to and you get cross-party support and hopefully consensus on how we can influence the Transport Bill to improve matters. And that, that's why I'm speaking in, in this debate. Uh, so in, in my area, with the price increases uh, that have impacted my constituents across Mary Hill and Springburn, let me just put in record, if there's any need to, of course, that it's unacceptable, it's unjustifiable, and it will have a direct impact on the quality of life of individuals and families across the area that I represent. It will impact on children, it will impact on job seekers, despite some of the mitigation around that. What a complete lack of self-awareness First Glasgow had, my local job centre closing, and to implement that price change. It will impact 
on the working poor, not just those unemployed, on the most vulnerable, and as we've heard, the IT excluded and some older citizens. All this from a so-called service without any meaningful consultation whatsoever, without any meaningful uh, equality impact assessment and no attempts to mitigate impacts. This should not be a legal thing to do. That's the point I would like to put on record, and we have to look at that. Now, quickly going to give you some algebra here, because I'm going to mention lots of bus services in my area that have been uh, diminuted or cancelled in recent years. We heard about the 4A. Um, now, the 4A used to go into Kelvindale, uh, so that was pulled from Kelvindale. So the M4 came along that I had to fight for as a use it or lose it service. It was a pretty poor service, but it was better than nothing. So we lost it, and SPT set in to subsidise an even more inferior service. What's the future for that? Who knows? Now, one of the ideas at that point was we could divert the 15 service from Summers in my constituency to go through Kelvindale. We can't do that anymore because the 15 no longer exists. That's been replaced by an eight service, which actually now, if you're still following this one, Minister, no longer goes down part of Sandbank Street in my constituency, which means vulnerable old people no longer get a bus to the local health centre. Now, there used to be a competitor to the first Glasgow and all of that in the Kelvindale area. It was Stagecoach, but Stagecoach couldn't make a profit, so the G2 service was pulled. But they had another service, they had the G1 service, and that served Fir Hill, it served Postle Park, and it served Hamilton Hill. That couldn't make money either. But there was yet another service, Minister, if you're still following this. Now, there was the M4 service, which was twice an hour through Hamilton Hill, a vital service now reduced to once an hour. Now, I spoke to First Glasgow and I spoke to SPT and I pointed out to them there was yet another service, the 128, which ran a very similar route to M4. I did no thanks, not on this occasion. So I suggested, could they not vary the 128 route to serve all the communities? The 128 was a subsidised route. I was told by both SPT and First Glasgow, that's not how things work. So if ever there was justification for some kind of integrated public bus service, franchise perhaps, because this is not efficient by any means of the imagination. We can run, a, we can run an improved service uh, at a cheaper cost and with lower fares. So let's look at franchising. Let's look how we go about that. And when you franchise, you can put in some form of price controls as well. So we got there in the end. And I would note that, for example, there's capping of rail increases, so it can be done. So whether or not it's the, if you're following this, just to recap, the 4A, the M4, the G1, the G2, the 15, the 8, or the 128, or even the 90, and others that I've not gone to mention yet, there's a much better way of doing this. Thank you to Ross Gear for bringing this to the public attention. Thank you to the Minister and the engagement I've had with you in trying to influence the transport bill that's going to come before the Parliament shortly. And hopefully we can get a consensus there's a better way to run a bus service, not just for my constituents across Mary Hill and Springburn, but across Glasgow, across Scotland, and preferably with much more public control. Colin Smith, followed by Maurice Corey. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer, and also my thanks to, to Ross Greer for tabling his motion. I know this issue has greatly concerned members in Glasgow and, and West Scotland, including my colleague Joanne Lamont and others who have campaigned vociferously on behalf of their constituents against First Buses' unacceptable fare hikes, which impact disproportionately on young people. It's a matter, President Officer, that raises some fundamental issues about how we manage bus services, not only in Glasgow and West Scotland, but right across the country. And it's on that matter I wish to focus my brief comments. As we know, buses are disproportionately used by young people, by older adults, the unemployed students and often other people on low incomes. Spiralling bus fares therefore hit those who can least afford it. And the savage cuts to services themselves that we've seen in recent years often removes the only viable travel option for many. First, buses' unacceptable fare increases are reflective of a wider trend of rises across bus companies right across Scotland. Adjusting for inflation, bus fares have increased by an average of 12% in the 10 years from 2006 to 2016. The latest set of fare rises aren't a one-off. They are a result of a system that is failing and will continue to fail until we intervene. And the challenges we face with bus services go beyond simply price hikes. There are growing problems with the regularity and availability of buses, including services often being removed by private bus companies with little warning and no consultation. 
Services across Scotland have been steadily diminished over recent years, with the vehicle kilometres covered by local bus services decreasing by 17 per cent from 2007 to 2016. With fares rising and services contracting, it is no surprise that bus use is plummeting. Provisional figures from Transport Scotland show the total number of journeys taken by bus buses each year in Scotland has declined by 19 per cent and in the South West and Strathclyde by 27 per cent between 2007 to 2016. These problems have been compounded by funding cuts, with total government support for buses going down by 12 per cent from 2009 to 2016, while the bus operating grants were cut by 22 per cent between 2007 and 2016. Today's budget deal will put further pressure on local council budgets who provide much of the funding for contracted bus services, which will inevitably lead to the loss of further routes. As well as the devastating impact these trends have in communities, failing to deliver sustainable public transport is also bad for our environment. President officer, we need to have a bold rethink when it comes to how we manage our bus services in Scotland. The government and the bus companies are failing the travelling public. People are being priced off the bus and connectivity, in particular in our small towns and rural areas, is being undermined. And staff within the bus companies are also being failed. As research by the Transport for Quality of Life reported, we have seen a race to the bottom with, and I quote, companies striving for commercial advantage through obtaining the lowest staff pay and worst working conditions. President officer, the case for re-regulation and alternative modes of bus ownership have never been stronger. Scotland has fallen behind much of the rest of the UK and government does need to wake up to the fact that the unregulated market simply isn't working. In the consultation set up by the government on improving the framework for deliver delivery of our bus services, the Minister has also already said that he's ruled out consideration of wholesale re-regulation before that consultation has taken place. We're therefore left with the possible alternative option of franchising. If implemented properly, this could result in significant improvements in services, but it must include local councils being able to run bus services, features such as standardised fares, and in developing proposals, I hope the government will also consider the possibility of a national bargaining agreement for workers' terms and conditions across the sector to stop the race to the bottom we have seen. And we also need to explore, as Joanne Lamont said, that the, the co-op party's people's bus proposals that would mean support in cooperative, social enterprise and other forms of not-for-profit bus operators and running bus services that are affordable and responsive to the needs of local people. Presiding officer, today's debate has been a good opportunity to expose the unfair price rises proposed by First Bus in Glasgow and the West of Scotland, but I hope it's also the start of a debate on how we radically reform our bus services in Scotland so that passengers, not profit, become the priority. Thank you. Call Maurice Corey to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me start by firstly thanking Ross Greer for bringing this very pertinent and interesting debate to, to this evening to the, the Chamber. And I believe that this motion has raised um, a number of important issues um, that will affect a large number of people, both in Glasgow and my, region, my West Scotland region. And it's good that we have the chance to talk about them this evening, and people have varying different views about it. It is vital that the bus firms remember that they are providing an essential public service. And it is important that they consider this when making their decisions, both commercially and for the, for the public per, uh, person. Every, every decision they make affects tens of thousands of people's daily lives. By putting up their fares by such a high inflation busting amount, they are putting a large demand on many people with tight budgets in this country. In particular, the 30% of Scottish households who do not have access to a car, a figure that is closer to 50% in Scotland's most deprived communities, will feel this de decision most of all. And the evidence that does point towards people being forced off buses due to fare increases. Figures show that the number of bus journeys fell from 436 million uh, in 2011-12 to 409 million in 2015-16, with provisional estimates showing a further fall to 393 million last year. Over the same period, fares have risen by nearly 60%. Undoubtedly, there must be a connection between the two. This was backed up, by the, as my colleague Jamie Green said earlier on, by independent analysis by the auditors KPMG that reduced bus services, reduced bus service routes, and increased bus journey times arising from congestion. Congestion, congestion accounted for a fall of 5.9 million trips, with the increases in bus fares being pinpointed at putting people off, making at least 4 million trips per year. But the reason that First Bus is able to put this, their, its fares up by 40% isn't due to a lack of government intervention into the marketplace, but due to a lack of competition in the market. 
In many areas of Scotland, individual bus firms have massive shares of the market, meaning they have no pressure on them to provide good quality vehicles, ensuring that they are punctual for a regular service and to keep fares as low as reasonable, uh, as reasonable costs. Now, I take slight issue here with, with, with um, Ross Greer because at the end of the day, with these private companies, th they are in it to, obviously to make profit to keep the buses running and they must reinvest in their buses and their equipment. And in my local area, uh, I was talking to our bus operator the other day, a private family business who runs a very good service, including the hospital service through from Helensburgh through Alexandria, Dumbarton through to the Royal Alexander Hospital and he's just recently invested again in new environmentally friendly buses which will please your party no end um, and these are not inconsiderable cost so they do have to balance but they do have a very good liaison with the councils involved both Western Bartonshire and indeed Argyll and Butte so I'm, I'm sure you want to make sure that we can keep yes Ross Greer. I thank the member uh, very much and I, I would of course absolutely agree with him moving towards environmentally sustainable fleets is important. Would he acknowledge that the issue is when it's a private company it is simply up to them and they are uh, working in the interests of their own private company. The issue is there's no regulation. A public service ran in a public interest would be compelled to improve services. With private companies it is at the whim of the owner of that private company. Maurice Corey. Um, I understand your point but I still come back to my point. It's a partnership. And the point, the partnership is you want professionals who run buses to run buses for you. I know from my, pre I was, my previous interest was a council in Argyll Butte Council, and that's the, the discussions I was having all the time with the officers, is if we're having private operators, then make sure we work in partnership with them, because they bring the equipment, they bring the skill and the knowledge. And I've seen bus routes we've had to cancel, and then we've had to relet again, and maybe more subsidies had to go in. So I think we just have to play each one it's come. But it is, a, it, if we can get together, I don't believe in total own, you might say state control ones but certainly there are people out there who want to invest and if you tease them properly and work with them then these private operators will deliver and certainly those who are very conscious of serving the community and I'm sure we all want to see an increase in the number of journeys being made using public transport particularly on the buses because it's more environmentally friendly as I just referred to the new buses in my area and because it will help fight congestion issues in many of our towns and cities from but to achieve the goal, we need to see more companies in the market, not more big government, as I'm following on from my point to Ross Greer. Um, and we also need to see more buses because I note, if you look at the figures and statistics that are around for the DVLA and people passing their driving tests, there were 100,000 less young people last year taking their driving tests, okay? Um, because the reason being is that the cost of running a motor car is more expensive nowadays and gets progressively more. So there's going to be more need for them to use the buses, which is good to hear that. But obviously we understand there's a shift in that market. And finally, I want to touch briefly upon the point that, that Ross Greer has made in his motion on the issue of smartphone technology. <clears throat> now, um, now I think we would all support business finding new ways and innovative ways of making life easier for customers, uh, but it strikes me a little bit unfair in respect to the smartphones which is being proposed. And as Ross Greer quite rightly pointed out, it, is main, it will mainly disadvantage poor people and the elderly, also known as the people most likely to use the bus, and I hope First Bus will reconsider that decision they have made. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to join other members in uh, welcoming the debate this evening brought forward by Ross Greer. Uh, and I have a few uh, brief remarks I want to make. I'm happy to support Mr Greer's motion because it gives us, has given us the opportunity to discuss concerns over fare rises by First Glasgow, um, over changes to uh, student day tickets by McGill's buses, but also to discuss wider issues about who runs public transport and who it's run for. Uh, like many members, I've spoken to many constituents concerned about Bus fare rises. I've also spoken to uh, constituents in the last few years in places like Eaglesham and the West End of Paisley who have been very concerned about bus service cuts uh, that have been made by First Glasgow. And too often, um, bus services have been cut back without any public consultation, and that has to change uh, going forward. <laughs> the proposal by McGill's Buses to withdraw student day tickets in particular has been met with significant opposition uh, from students in my region. The issue has been raised, as Ross Gear said, by members of the Scottish Youth Parliament, such as Josh Kennedy, who should be commended for their campaigning efforts. As has been mentioned, over 5,000 people have signed an online petition calling for student day tickets to be reinstated. This shows the strength of feeling there is amongst local uh, young people, and it's important uh, that they are listened to. 
Students, as has been mentioned, are among some of the most regular bus users, and I know from speaking to a number of students in Renfrewshire and in Verclyde myself that student tickets provided by companies like McGill's are actually very popular, but also often a financial necessity, and that perhaps explains the response that we have seen. As I've said before, and I will say again, we do have a broken bus market, and we have seen a decade of decline in terms of bus patronage, which has been mentioned uh, today. It's hard to see how increasing fares generally and this significant increase on fares for students will reverse that decline. Surely across the whole parliament uh, we understand that there must be modal shift towards public transport if we are to tackle climate change, improve social inclusion and alleviate congestion in urban areas. But the figures, as Maurice uh, Corey has just uh, mentioned, sadly show we are going in the wrong direction. Now, I hope in the case uh, of McGill's buses, uh, they will listen to the views of thousands of local students in my region. And I'm sure they will take seriously the views expressed by members of the Scottish Youth Parliament. I hope First Glasgow will listen to the issues uh, that have been raised by other members uh, today as well. Uh, we know uh, from the briefings that we've provided, for example, from the Confederation of Passenger Transport, that there are concerns uh, from bus companies about the operation, uh, the conditions that they uh, operate in. And although I don't always agree with uh, the bus companies, I do think they make a valid point about the links between investment in buses and wider social benefits. But clearly, if we can't get a rethink from McGill's buses on the issue of student day tickets, and if we can't get a rethink from First Glasgow on the issues uh, that have been presented to them, it surely provides further evidence that the status quo is not an option. Uh, President officer, I, I declare uh, I am a member of the Co-op Party and Unite, the union, and like them, I, I believe that public transport is a public service and it should be run in the interests of passengers, not just the big bus companies. I believe that only with greater democratic control over bus services can we secure a fairer deal for bus passengers in areas like Renfrewshire. And I hope in the forthcoming transport bill, we will see measures that make that aim a reality. And I would urge the minister to be bold and to be radical, and he will have the support of many Scotland's passengers if he does just that. Thank you. I call Hamza Youssef to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Ross Greer for bringing this uh, motion to the Chamber. He's absolutely right. It's actually quite incredible that 75% of public transport journeys are done by bus, yet it does not get the airtime to reflect that at all. So really important that Ross Greer has brought this uh, motion. I thought the debates and the contributions uh, by members across the Chamber uh, was excellent and, and a lot of food for thought. I'm going to try my best to address as many of their points uh, as I can uh, in the seven minutes uh, there are the outs that I have. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, I completely understand the frustration of passengers uh, when there are fare increases, of course, unwelcomed on any mode of transport, I've got no doubt at all. Uh, but clearly passengers feel that they're not, in some cases, getting the service uh, that justifies a fares increase. So my uh, complete understanding uh, for them uh, on that. I think it's probably important for me to use the time that I have to try to focus on the common areas of action that we can take forward, particularly in the transport bill, but through other initiatives too. Uh, and there's no point probably uh, spending too much time on where there's some obvious disagreements, wholesale re-regulation, uh, for example, being, being, being one of them. Uh, just in terms of ownership, uh, I would suggest for those members that haven't spoken to passenger groups, like Passenger Focus uh, and others, it's probably worthwhile doing so because the feedback I get from those passenger organisations is that who owns the buses is less of an issue, uh, but what is an issue for passengers tends to be, for example, uh, the reliability, the affordability and so on and so forth. Now, of course, I know some members will say that there's an inevitable link between the two, uh, but I will just make the point before I give way to John Finney that it's worth noting that in 1960s, between 1960 and indeed 1974, when the buses were, uh, of course, regulated, that that was the period of the steepest decline uh, that we've seen. So this is not a, a decade of decline, as was mentioned by uh, one member. Actually, this is decades of decline, for which every single one of us that has been in, in power or in government uh, has some responsibility over. But of course, I give way to John Finney. John Finney. Thank you, President. Officer. I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way. I, I readily accept that passengers want a good service and ownership becomes a secondary issue. But if there's problems, there is a line of accountability with public ownership that doesn't exist if there's a profit motive. 
Hamza Youssef. While I accept that, and I'll come to the point of more public and democratic accountability in our bus services. Uh, Neil uh, Bibby made the point that uh, he doesn't believe the status quo uh, is working, and I would agree with his assessment on that, and that's why I want to come to some of uh, the measures that we are taking forward uh, in the transport bill. But before I do, uh, let me also reiterate the point that I thought members articulated well here, that in many of our urban conurbations in particular, congestion is clearly uh, an issue. Now, local authorities have some powers, of course, over tackling uh, congestion, and I know there's some excellent work being done in some of our cities to look to try to tackle that. One example would be uh, the recently announced Glasgow Connectivity Commission, uh, headed by David Begg, which I think will be, know who will be known to, to many members uh, across here, uh, somebody I respect uh, greatly, who will be chairing that to look at the challenges facing transport, but particularly with a focus uh, on uh, congestion, how to tackle uh, congestion. Now, yes, of course I can. Bob Doris. Thank you, President. My constituents wouldn't forgive I didn't point out one of the things they're doing in Glasgow to deal with congestion is having less bus stops, which means there's less places to get off and it's actually impacting on the quality of service for lots of my constituents. So there's contradictions there in some of these public policy things that happen at a local level. If I didn't raise that, my constituents wouldn't forgive me. I'm sorry, yes, sir. Pleased he has received the forgiveness uh, of his uh, constituents and, and his right to have raised uh, that issue. It's one that he should raise, uh, of course, with Glasgow, but I believe that's the whole purpose of the Connectivity Commission is to look at local policies that might affect transport uh, in a connected way, in an integrated uh, way. Uh, back to Neil Bibby's uh, point about uh, the status quo not working and, and asking us to, to be bold and, and to be radical. Uh, I believe that the, the, the measures that we're consulting on and have consulted on uh, that will be for inclusion within the transport bill are indeed bold, uh, are indeed radical, and of course are a shift from the status quo. And I, of course, look forward to members scrutinising those in great detail and coming back to us with their suggestions and potential amendments uh, on that bill. But we are looking at things like, for example, partnership working, enhanced partnership working, which uh, I know is something that, for example, SPT with the Strathclyde Bus Alliance concept, uh, Glasgow City Council and others are very, very interested uh, in doing. Of course, it brings forward and consults on, on measures such as local franchising, which has been mentioned uh, by some members. Again, this is because local authorities ask us uh, very much for those powers. Uh, and something we're also doing is removing, uh, looking to do or hope to do, is to move the, remove the legal dubiety that exists around whether or not you can have municipally or council owned, council -owned uh, bus companies. You know, there's some legal dubiety around that and we intend to, to remove that to give local authorities uh, the option uh, to do so. I thought Joanne Lamont made a very good point uh, in, in respect to uh, fares uh, and um, you know, often the public not knowing uh, what the fare structure is. And she also mentioned uh, the, the, the disincentive or reverse incentive, I think as she called it, uh, around single fares. And that's why we've also consulted on open data, uh, open data effectively forcing uh, bus operators uh, to be more open, more transparent with the fare structures. Uh, uh, of course, I will. <coughs> Johan Lamont. This is a point that's been raised with me, so you could clarify for me that the way in which the concessionary scheme is calculated as a percentage of the single bus fare. If that is the case, it creates an incentive for the company to maintain that price at a higher level. If that is true, that is something within your gift right now to change, and I wonder what your comments are on that. Hamza Yusuf. And we are in active discussions with CPT uh, about the concessionary uh, fare reimbursement because it is a point that she raises, but it's a point that other people have raised with me uh, too, and I'm more than happy to keep it updated on that. Clearly, when we talk about concessionary travel, for which we've had a consultation on recently, uh, which she may, may, may or may not have uh, contributed to, that she'll know that we have to get agreement with the bus company. So there is some give in and some, some, some take. But certainly this issue in the single fare is one uh, that has been uh, raised with me. If he doesn't mind, can I just make some progress? Uh, because I do want to talk about some of the other measures uh, in the transport uh, bill and other measures we're taking forward. I thought one that Jamie Green, uh, just on cue, mentioned that I thought was worth uh, reiterating here was our emission uh, redu reduction uh, in, in, in emissions. Uh, agenda that we have in introducing low emission zones, for me, buses are very much part of the solution, not part of the problem. So therefore, if we can reduce private car ownership going into our city centres where the first four low emission zones will be, then I think we're on to uh, a winner more certainly. And if uh, Jamie Green wants, I'm happy to give uh, way. Jamie Green. Uh, I do thank the uh, Minister. I, it, how would the Minister respond to suggestions and perhaps anecdotal suggestions at that that if there are substantive changes to uh, the pricing structure uh, for concessionary travel and the subsidy given to bus companies, 
that their reaction to that would be simply to reduce and cut services. Hamza Yusuf. It shouldn't be because concessionary travel reimbursement is based on the premise of being no worse off. So we negotiate with CPT on the basis of being no worse, no worse or no better off. Uh, so therefore that should never be a justification for that. But it does bring me to a good point about uh, local democratic engagement and some members have made the point that they feel bus services are cut uh, and there's not been adequate uh, engagement with the local community. Uh, what I would say is, uh, of course, we expect uh, bus operators to have that engagement, but of course our proposals in the transport bill uh, will absolutely ensure that passengers are at the very heart of bus service uh, delivery. So I accept that that is absolutely uh, feeling of some people in some communities uh, and of course uh, uh, bringing forward the transport bill with the bus element to it I should hopefully be able to put some of that democratic accountability at the heart of it. Uh, what I would also say is that one size clearly doesn't fit all. So I think all of us would recognise where there are some unacceptable practices by bus operators. Uh, it's worth saying there are some very, very good practices by bus operators uh, as well. One example of that for, uh, that, that hasn't been mentioned is West Coast Motors where there's a, a pull out from First East uh, West Coast Motors, a private company who are now rebranded in, in that part of the world as Borders Buses, uh, is an example of a commercial uh, market working very, very well, as I, as I say. So not necessarily, what I'm getting at, I suppose, is that one size doesn't necessarily fit all. What I'm aiming to do with the transport bill, which I hope members will support, is give local authorities uh, all the tools in their toolbox to bring uh, whatever... Uh, no, the minister's what, just closing. Uh, what, what, whatever uh, whatever uh, size uh, fits uh, their uh, local... Uh, area. What I will say, because uh, I know I'm obviously running out of time here, uh, Joanne Lamont did ask if I would meet uh, with her, of course I will, uh, and with the co-op, of course I will. Uh, she asked me uh, when I'd met First Bus. I don't remember the exact date, but it was around about two weeks ago, but I'm happy to provide her with that information. I think I tweeted about that meeting, in fact, actually, uh, as well, uh, and I did mention the fare rises, and of course they told me that they'd uh, reversed their job seeker uh, rise, but they understood uh, robustly my concerns uh, around that. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, I met recently, last week, uh, Unite the Union and Jackson Culnane uh, on uh, their Hold the Bus campaign, and I'm more than happy to meet members uh, about uh, their uh, issues uh, regarding the bus uh, sector. So I think on that note, uh, I will close. I look forward to members' contributions towards the Transport Bill, and I hope that we can uh, build a bus service that is fit not just for uh, the, uh, the people and communities uh, of Scotland for now, but uh, future-proof it so that there's adequate bus services uh, for communities uh, right into the future. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Minister. Can, can I just say to members by way of explanation, the standing orders dictate how long a member's debate should last unless we extend it uh, beyond that for a maximum of half an hour. And we were getting near to the point where I would have had to extend for the space of 30 seconds or something. So uh, that concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.